Season two of Prime Video's take on The Lord of the Rings is now upon us. And boy, do we have plenty of thoughts about The Rings of Power. Now, unlike a lot of LOTR fans, Bahir and I really enjoyed the first season of The Rings of Power. We thought it was a very good way in adapting and retelling all of the untold bits of Tolkien's story. I will go so far as to say it is the best way if you wanted more Middle-earth. And I always want more Middle-earth. I agree with that 100% because you are looking at someone who has tried for the better part of 20 years to read The Silmarillion and failed each and every time. Because I get so excited after reading The Hobbit and rereading Lord of the Rings, which I do over and over again. And I'm like, you know what? This year is the year. This is I'm the one. I'm going to crack open The Silmarillion. I've even bought multiple copies thinking, you know, maybe if I had a different cover, different texture on the pages, it might get me in the mood. Nope. Three or four chapters and I'm out. I'm like, this is boring. For me, it's less that it's boring and more just that it's hard to read. Okay, I take that back. It's not boring, it's dense. It's dense. It's there's a lot of very similar names you have to keep track of. It's very dry. It's dry, yeah. It jumps around quite a bit. And so I completely disagree with those assholes who call this fanfic. I don't think it's that at all because I think it does a real disservice to the work that the writers have done because I think that the showrunners and the writers on The Rings of Power have done a tremendous job in capturing Tolkien's voice. When you watch it, it feels like Lord of the Rings. And his tone, his timber, his intent, it's all there. And I think for the casual observer who's not on the side of Rings of Power, I will also tell you that you don't know what the fuck you're talking about because Peter Jackson rewrote a lot of that a original lot. book. He jumped quite a lot of the story. He moved characters around. He deleted characters completely. Dude, for the longest time, I call the movies the good bits version. Yes. There's a lot in the books that isn't covered. And Peter Jackson cherry-picked the best bits, as you should do for a cinematic adaptation, because not everything is going to work on screen, as we learnt from what he did with The Hobbit, where he just made up shit. And then ended up with three three-hour-long movies that felt completely unnecessary. Based on a book that you can read in one day. Pretty much. Just the last bits of getting that out of the way. I think if you are one of those people who don't like Rings of Power, that's fine. Fuck off. Like, I love it. Don't get it cancelled for me. Because then you're just a literal troll. Then you're a literal troll who just doesn't like the fact that there are brown elves. Because that is a segment of the so-called fan base who have a problem with the Rings of Power. I mean, I mean wait till they see season two because there are more colored elves. I can't wait, motherfucker. Oh, just the hate. It's the same with the people who hated the fact that the Aragorn card in The Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering was based on a black guy. I think I've been well clear about how I don't like race swapping. So, for example, I don't want to see a black Bruce Wayne, nor do I want to see a black Hell Jordan. However, with Aragon, who is a character based off text, I think it's okay. No, but also with the case of Bruce Wayne and Hal Jordan, we're going slightly off topic here, but I think it's important to bring up. With Bruce Wayne or Hal Jordan, there are fantastic characters in Jon Stewart, for example. And Lucius Fox's son. And Lucius Fox's son, who becomes a version of Batman in the comics as well. So there are these black characters who portray these superheroes and do it incredibly well. And you don't have to race swap those. But I'm a huge fan of artists interpreting text in their own way. And I think that's been done for years. All of that noise just comes down to a very narrow interpretation of literature and art, and it's just kind of symbolic of your own baggage more than anything else. It's completely your own baggage because if you've ever read any of Tolkien, the man's writings, he is the furthest thing away from being someone who is racist or race-driven or white-driven. 
he is very clear with regards to how he sees the world and how he wants the world to be seen. And I'm exactly. talking about the real world. I'm not talking about Middle Earth. So I I don't see a world where J.R.R. Tolkien will be unhappy with the Black Arrow God. All right. Rant out of the way. Season 2 is fucking fantastic. I enjoy it so much. We were given all the episodes ahead of time, which is a rare thing. And I'm very glad they did because... We sat and binged through all of it. It's one of the rare occasions where we were very happy to just play one episode after the other because it kind of scratched an itch. It's like what you said earlier, Bahe. As fans of Lord of the Rings, we want more. And I think, for better or for worse, it's a very good time to be a fan of Lord of the Rings. It seems like Warner is screwing Prime Video over after making them spend all of that money acquiring the rights only to say, we're making more movies. But for the fans, man, we got an animated thing coming out. We got Prime Video making season after season of the Rings of Power. We have more movies coming. It's just getting back into Middle Earth. And I don't have a problem with it as long as they do it well. And Prime Video is doing it very, very well. They're spending money on it. They've assembled a tremendous cast and they're building out this story in a slow and purposeful way, which is why I love it so much. It feels like I'm reading a book. It doesn't feel like they're in any rush to go anywhere, which means I can spend a lot of time in this world, get to know these characters and feel the tension build slowly throughout a season. It reminds me of early Game of Thrones before someone had the idea that the reason people love Game of Thrones so much is because of the dragons. So let's just have lots of dragons and confuse people and distract them from the fact that this isn't going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, with the Rings of Power, specifically with season two, I feel like they've gotten the introduction out of the way, right? Like the first season was a lot about, oh, let's introduce you to a young Galadriel. Let's introduce you to a young Elrond. Oh, let's introduce you to a younger Calabrimbor. And all that is great. Although, can I just stop you there for a second? Just to go back to our earlier rant. Yeah, I know. I was going to go there too, but go ahead. Because I feel like if you have a problem with Morpheus Clark's portrayal of young Galadriel, then you're an idiot. Because obviously the Galadriel we meet in Lord of the Rings is hundreds of years old and is going to be a completely different person from youthful Galadriel. It's just like how you and I are different people at 40 than we were at 17. And that's only 23 years, not hundreds of years, you fucking idiots. I was very specific with my use of the words young when I mentioned these characters. Right, because it's called character growth and development. And we're not not even talking about character growth over the course of eight hours of TV. We're talking about character growth over the course of a century. Correct. This is done in the second age. The Rings of Power is based in the second age. You know those movies people love so much? is in the third age. Several hundred years later. So please, sit down, shut the fuck up. Go read a book. Go read a book. Yeah, go read a book. I remember reading comments regarding Moffat Clark's portrayal of Galadriel in the first season, people were saying like, oh, this isn't the same character. Peter Jackson's movies and even in the books, Galadriel is not going to be fighting. She's not climbing mountains. Yeah, that's she's several hundred years later. It's a completely different person. She's not only is she older, she's in a different status of elven lore, right? Like she's become a respected elder. She's no longer just a general, which she is here. She's a general, by the by, right? Gilgalad makes her a general. So she's, yeah, she can wield the sword. Right. Sorry. Getting back to Rings of Power season two, we have a lot to say about this. I mean, look, I think for me, I echo everything you said. There is so much that is good here, especially with the way they are taking their time. Season one was an introduction to the Halfwoods. Season one was an introduction to the dwarves in Khazad Dun. For me, I think the Khazad Dun thing is, is the most interesting because if you've only ever read the Lord of the Rings books and if you've only seen the Lord of the Rings movies, you don't know, you forget that Khazad Dun was a dwarf fortress. It was where dwarves dwelled <laughs> and lived and succeeded and prospered right and i love that we get to see that here we get to see these 
these places before there were other things that we recognize from the Lord of the Rings. And just the building out of the Southlands, the building out of the Elvish High Council, Linden, to, to fucking see Numenor, all that's just great because these are just legends and stories that we had heard from Lord of the Rings, be the book or the movies. But now to see it, to live in it, to be with it. And look, I'm sorry, this isn't a trailer, not spoiler. But the fucking eagles show up in Newman. Oh my god. It's I, so good. It's so good. Like, ah, oh, Tom Bombadil. Anyway, so go on. Yeah, you have it. You you talk now. I need to breathe. I think another thing that's particularly interesting about this season is where everyone is and how their stories are being told. Because there's a lot of stuff at play here, and I think the showrunners take these interesting approaches in telling the different stories. So Sauron is with Calabrimbo throughout this entire season, right? Because the rings are being manufactured and we know that Sauron has influence over these things. But what's taking place in that story is this weird psychodrama, right? It's almost like a thriller. It's like one person tormenting the other person, slowly teasing them, trying to manipulate them to get their way. Also, what's beautiful about that is that we, the audience, know what's happening there, right? We Correct. recognize Anata for who he is, but Calabrimbo doesn't. And I think that that is beautiful. And Calabrimbo's own insecurity and need for validation comes into play as well. But we, the audience, is just going like, don't listen to him. Don't listen to this magic Jesus elf that just walked out of the fire. And then over in Numenor, we have a political thriller going on, which is very Game of Thronesy, And then we've got this military style operation happening with the elves who are trying to figure out what's going on with Sauron and the rings and then there is Poppy and Nori and the stranger in what feels like a western almost good the bad and the ugly they're in the desert we see a desert for the first time on Middle Earth it's all very cool but there are all of these genres at play which I find quite interesting because each one is telling a different story in a different way and yet it feels seamless to the world that they've created Yes. You know why? Because time. Yes. Because time. What the later seasons of Game of Thrones failed and what the House of the Dragon constantly fucking fail is to not tell you, the audience, that time is passing. People just magically appear out of portals or whatever. It happens in an instant. Whereas here... In Rings of Power, when the story jumps to follow, say, Nori and Poppy with The Stranger, or when we go and spend time with Calabrimbo or with Anata, you know that the rest of the world is turning. It is keeping going, right? Whatever the stuff that you left at Linden or whatever the stuff that you left at Numenor or whatever the stuff you left off with like Galadriel and Gilgalad with the Elven High Council, you know that's still keeping going while you're in this particular story. So it never feels like everything is happening only when you're the audience paying attention. Exactly. Also, it's not like they have hand phones or Google Maps or fax machines. Or dragons. Or dragons. And nobody knows what's happening in the other place. And no one can get there lightning fast either. It takes time. And so therefore, evil machinations can take place while one person is trying to get from Linden to Numenor. And the writers tell you that. So even when like Galadriel and Elrond are trying to make their way to tell Calabrimbo about Sauron, we see Anata doing a thing because he knows the other elves are coming. He is given the time to do dark machinations yes and that is beautiful the writers don't look at travel time as a bad thing the writers don't look at character downtime as a bad thing it's when you build up characters it's when you build reasons for things to happen and also it builds to something worthwhile when you get to the end of this season and you reach that final episode goosebumps man i'm telling you it is worth it by the time you hit that point, everything comes into play. And it's very clear that they're going somewhere with this. And they're going somewhere important. And they have a plan on how they want to tell this story. Needless to say, everyone is doing the best possible job. The entire cast is phenomenal. 
I love Charlie Vickers as Sauron. I think the way he plays Anata versus the way he played Halbrand is completely different. We get a nice little prologue at the beginning of this season that explains some stuff that we didn't get in season one and everything kind of fits. But also there is this fascinating duality to him in that I realize he is the Dark Lord and he is the personification of evil. But at the same time, when I watch Charlie Vickers play him, because of course, remember, we don't really see human Sauron in any way until this point. And so when we see Charlie Vickers play him, for a second, I'm like, is he conflicted? Does he want to be bad all the time? Are there elements of good? And then he will do something and I'm like, no, it's all part of his plan. We've never seen, well, other than the opening sequence. It's only in the opening sequence of the first movie, right? That we see any form of Sauron. Yeah. And even then, I think the thing to remember is that Charlie Vickers is playing Sauron, the lieutenant of the Dark Lord Morgoth. Yes. He hasn't. Sauron hasn't become that evil yet. He is still a general. So at the beginning, in the flashback background to the character, when we see him lose to someone else, it still makes sense. Yes. Because he isn't the Dark Lord Sauron yet. He's still just a lieutenant of Morgoth. He needs to get all those rings, motherfucker. He hasn't gotten the rings yet. So he's still just... A fucking lieutenant. So he can lose. So he can be punched in the face. Yeah. None of that's wrong. Yeah. Ugh. Watching him do that is fantastic. I think the other character that I really enjoy is Farazon in Numenor, who is the cousin of the queen. And same with the kind of political machinations he's doing. I'm always constantly questioning his motives. And I think that was the thing that I had with early Game of Thrones as well, because it allowed me to hate and love characters and switch allegiances, because with every season, their circumstances changed, and these were complicated individuals facing complicated problems. And I'm getting that with the Rings of Power. It's something we didn't necessarily get with the Lord of the Rings, because obviously in the Lord of the Rings, the good guys were the good guys. And they were very, very good. Sure, some of them were conflicted a little bit, but at the same time, they were heroic. And the thing to remember is that when Peter Jackson made The Lord of the Rings with Philippa Boyens and Fran Walsh, the key driving force for them was remove everything that wasn't about the ring getting to Mount Doom. Anything yes. that isn't in service of the Hobbit Frodo Baggins getting to Mount Doom to drop the ring is removed, right? So even... Even when Merry and Pippin get caught by the orcs and we follow the trio of Aragorn, Gimli and Legolas chasing that down, that was because in both the book and in the film, that was used as a distraction from Frodo and Sam, right? So that was always the point. We never really see like Merry and Pippin go into the forest and get picked up by Treebeard in the book, there's a whole thing. <laughs> there's a whole fucking thing about them just trying, to, not even trying to convince Treebeard to go to the ends with their message. Just a whole conversation between Mary Pippin and Treebeard about the story of the ends and all that. Chapters, right? In real time, that was, I think, about two months. <laughs> yeah. Thinking. So anything that isn't in service of Frodo getting the ring to Mount Doom is removed. And... I loved that for a nine-hour epic. That was what I wanted. However, in a format where I can have more than nine hours to tell a story over the course of several years and potentially a film, The Rings of Power is able to sort of breathe that out. And I love that. I love seeing Numenor. I love seeing what brought the fall of Numenor. I love the fact that we're actually seeing the making of the rings and the building of it and the fact that not all of the rings have got Sauron's fingerprints on it and why that's special and different. And that's important, right? Because important. when you call something the rings of power, you need to deliver on that promise. And this show doesn't lose sight of that. In season two, 
There's a lot of stuff about rings. So if you're there for rings, you're going to get what you're looking for. And I, for one, am glad that they do because it is the core tenet of what comes next. It's not just a MacGuffin. Because it's called the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> There's a reason. The rings are important. Like, like the rings that go to the leaders of men and become the and they then become the ring race. It's not just the building of a villain. It's why is that ring important? In the Lord of the Rings, that's just, I wouldn't call it a throwaway, but it's just like, oh yeah, they got rings, Sauron polluted them, now they're ring wraiths. Oh, they're bad people. But how it got to them is important for me. How that sort of ring ruined the minds of men. I think that's what's interesting. And there is a compelling story behind that. Just as how there is a compelling story behind The Stranger, we won't call him what we think he is because he may not be, but... I really hope he's not. Can really? Can I just say, I really hope he's not. Well, I mean, there are five histories who are, are supposed to be to in go. Middle yeah, Earth, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one is still wearing grey. The others yeah, have yeah. their own unique colours as well. Yeah, So unless I know. he changes his robes... Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. And then, of course, Kieran Hines shows up as a dark wizard. Yeah. Who has very similar makeup to Saruman, but we know he's not Saruman. Yes. Or at least we think he's not, but he cannot be because Saruman starts off good. This guy is already bad. And so he might be another early Istari arrival. The other thing I love about the Rings of Power is even though I've read the main texts and some of the side texts. There is still stuff here that surprises me. Yes, I know where Calabrimbor ends up. I know where Sauron ends up, where Galadriel ends up. But despite knowing that, the show still offers me some surprises and mysteries. And I like it because it surprises and mysteries that aren't altering the text. They're just delivering it in an interesting way. Like the like making Tom Bombadil Yoda-esque, yeah. I think is a very clever approach because Tom Bombadil is this eternal character. Even Tolkien said it doesn't matter what his origins are or who he is. And Tolkien never answered that question. And so you've got lots of mysteries to dive into, even with Tom Bombadil. And making him a Yoda to the stranger, I think, is a great approach. So far the writers have not decided to, and I hope they don't, doesn't look like they will, rewrite the text. I don't want to know that suddenly Tom Bombadil was in the battles. I don't want to know that, that Gandalf was the wizard that designed the hand phone. I don't think they'll do that though. I think they are very respectful to the original text. And even though they've dramatized elements in the histories, they haven't changed the actual history, and I think that's the important thing. That's a great way of putting it, right? The show creators for the Rings of Power have dramatized the Silmarillion, which yes. is essentially just a history textbook. They've dramatized the day-to-day -day or the events of the fall of Numenor, and I think that's beautiful. You know, we did a bunch of interviews with some of the cast, and one of them made the best suggestion for me. She said... How she got through the Silmarillion, which I haven't tried, is actually doing the audiobook. Oh. Right? Shit. I was like, oh shit, it didn't even occur to me. So I'm going to log on to my Audible account, which has been lying dormant for a while. I think I still have some free credits. And I'm going to pick up the audiobook and give it a shot. Oh, that's worth a shot. I'm not sure who's narrating it though. I'm, I'm hoping it's Ian McKellen, but I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I want... Oh, no, actually, no, now that you mentioned it, I want Ian McKellen as Gandalf narrating the Silmarillion. Oh, that would be good. Oh. <laughs> but yes, I'm yeah. going to try the audiobook yeah, and I'll see if that. it helps me get through it any easier. But, but, Rings of Power Season 2 holds up. I think that if you love the books, that if you love Lord of the Rings, heck, I think if you're a Game of Thrones fan, an OG Game of Thrones fan, sure, Lord of the Rings was never big on sex and violence. But if you like that sort of fantasy and world building, then this show is definitely for you as well because it captures the spirit and tone of those early Game of Thrones narratives. The way they paced their storytelling and rooted it in character, it is all there. We highly, highly recommend the series. And if you didn't like Rings of Power Season 1, don't tell us. 
I don't need to know that you didn't like it. It's fine. You didn't like it. That's okay. I'm not going to call you names now. Heck, we don't even want to know you. You don't have to go around telling people you didn't like something just to feel validated. It's okay. You didn't like it. I don't like anime. People tell me all the time I'm wrong and I tell them I don't care. That's fine. Don't watch it. Don't watch season two if you didn't like season one. That's fine. Don't waste your time. Go watch something else. Let us know what you think about season two when you catch it. We think it's great. You can reach out on all of our social media feeds, GogglerMY. You can also email us on podcast at goggler.my or send us a WhatsApp on the Goggler hotline, 012-524-5208. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Goggler Podcast.